I mean, that's what it is, and you know, we all age. And the question is, uh, why do we age differently? And, and more importantly, what are the things that actually can make a difference? You know, it always it never ceases to amaze me uh, how um, of all those these trials we've seen over the years, right? All the clinical trials you discuss, all the interesting clinical trials that are contradictory with each other. There are thousands and thousands of studies done on nutritional, thousands of studies done on drugs. Uh, there is a numerous um, uh, 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 meta-analysis that try to put, make sense to all of the data that we get, often contradictory. But every one of those trials has always missed a one very important point, and that is genetics, right? That when we actually have a study of any kind, no matter the size of the study, we never really take into account the genomics reality of each individual, right? So what, where are we today in terms of anti-aging strategies, especially nutritional strategies and, and genomics? Now, the, the time is coming now where there will be no nutritional program in the world that will actually ignore the reality of your genes. And what I want to do today is not to give you a lecture on, or lecture you on genetics, but to actually share some information that's going to allow you to make some important decisions. I want you to see and understand why people respond differently. And there are a number of factors where that happen. Why do people actually have a totally separate and, and distinct reaction to a particular uh, 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 nutritional element? Uh, does everybody, for example, respond the same way when it comes down to a particular supplementation? Uh, one of the most interesting things that I learned over the years now is that not everybody responds the same when they take omega-3. Now, we tend to promote omega-3 for everybody, right? Now we know that about 7% of the population actually does not tolerate omega-3. And in fact, the, the fact that you, when you place them on a higher dose of omega-3, they actually produce more LDL. And often people say to me, gee, you know, I've seen this in my clinic, and I could not believe that it could happen. But the reality is that not everybody would respond similarly. And the difference is, in, in fact, in a composition of our genetic makeup. But more importantly is on how our genes are actually expressing themselves, how our genes, in fact, are regulated and had been uh, affected by our lifestyle. There are many opportunities that are available to us to expand in the use of nutraceuticals and food substances um, in, t in terms of achieving a healthier lifestyle and achieving a healthier outcome. The important issue here is that to understand the interaction between nutritional elements and genomics in general. The overall um, perspective and the overall objective is, of course, to reduce mortality, to prevent disease, and to extend uh, the, you know, the lifespan of humanity and mankind and retain quality of life. Now, when we look at the world leading, leading causes of mortality uh, in 2002, clearly you see that the age groups between 15 uh, years of age and 59 are somewhat different to those who are 60 plus. But in general, we find that the you know, cardiovascular disease uh, and certain types of infections appear to have uh, uh, together with cancers, the, perhaps the most prevalent uh, leading causes of mortality. You know, the older people tend to be very specific in that. The, the, these groups, in fact, uh, of course, rate uh, ischemic heart disease as number one cause of, 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 of mortality, uh, together with some of the other uh, conditions, which are actually well common and understood by yourself uh, only too well. Uh, the interesting thing is that often we know that five out of the ten leading causes of death, especially in the United States, are related to dietary habits. Now, this is something we always understood and uh, we've taken in some respect for granted. Now, uh, when you look at, for example, the incidence of cancer in males by region, Australia, New Zealand, and North America are on the highest level, right? With Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, and Northern Europe following behind, and of course Asia is showing the best possible or the lowest levels of incidence of cancer in males. Okay, now the interesting question is uh, why is it the Asians actually display that uh, lower uh, rate of incidence of cancer compared to Western, Western countries? We now understand through some of the WHO reports that at least 80% of premature heart disease, strokes, and type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers could be prevented through a healthy diet, regular physical exercise, and to avoid tobacco byproducts. In Southeast Asia, region, for example, a 2% reduction in death could result in roughly uh, uh, saving around 8 million lives in the next 10 years. In, in India, for example, a similar reduction could result in an economic gain of around $15 billion over the next 10 years. Any impact that you might have 
in the prevention of these diseases, of course, is going to have a significant economic and social impact. Now, the public health approach has always been very specific. You know, we have the food guide pyramid, which is a bit extremely controversial. We know that now that we, we, we turn this pyramid around, upside down, to be able to make sense out of that. But this has been the, the, the approach of the systems of the governments to be able to deal with this uh, emerging number of diseases and premature deaths. When we look at the environment that's surrounding this industry, we find that there have been very significant changes over the years, and I find that Australia is one of the leading countries in this regard. As you remember, uh, a few years ago, we actually demonstrated that we actually consume uh, more nutraceuticals. We spend more money in the consumption of nutraceuticals than we do uh, on the prescription drugs. Uh, I think that the figures were $3.5 billion two years ago in expenditure in nutritional products versus $1.7 billion in pharmaceuticals. Australia leads the way in that regard. I think people in Australia have a much greater perception and understanding of the importance of nutritional input and the importance of a proper lifestyle in terms of, uh, of uh, retaining a, a quality of life and longevity. Uh, when you look at the consumption of uh, various supplementations, organic foods, functional foods, and personal care, you'll see that between 2004 and 2005, um, in the United States, there's been a significant changes in the yearly changes. The more interesting one is organic foods, which has increased by almost 13%, and functional foods, which I believe will lead, um, uh, perhaps have been one of the most significant changes in the way we perceive foods in the future by almost a 9 to 10%. Right? Personal care has increased by 8.5%. Now, the figures for the year 2005 and 2008 essentially has shown a significant increase in supplementation consumption and organic foods as well. The United States is, is displaying a very strong interest in the, adopting the use of organic foods. In fact, the whole, uh, you know, the whole supermarket chains called Whole Foods, I don't know if you're familiar with them, that have really an interesting range of organic foods of all sorts, organic by, uh, products, uh, supplementation. So I think the United States is, in fact, uh, making some significant changes in that regard, um, and, and Australia is not lagging far behind. Yes, in fact, low diet fights don't work. I eat fish every day, and my butt still drags on the ground, right? The important question that is normally raised is, is that there is an assumption behind all of this that, that all individuals are expected to respond equally to drug foods or food supplementations components in general. And it's a misconception, right? There's significant variation between each individual, not only between races, but also between individuals. So it is very important to understand that difference and to, to be able to show that there is a cause and effect situation in terms of our response to a particular input. When you look at the variability across studies, and this has always interested me tremendously, he, he, what you see here is a response of protection against breast cancer uh, following the consumption of soy byproducts. There have been numerous studies. In general, the trend is that Asians show a much lower level of risk than Western diet, right? So Western diet in general appears to show very little protection or lower protection against breast cancer than do the, the, you know, the Asian types or diets. The important thing about this study is it shows very significant variability depending on who does the study, what is being used as a source of soy, for example, some of them use bean curd, miso, uh, tofu, soy milk, etc., etc. So you see significant variability between these groups and between races and regions uh, compared with each other. So essentially what we're looking at is uh, obviously an impact of soy byproducts in being able to prevent um, breast cancer. However, within the local regions, we see also enorm enormous variability. And we always had this in mind. What is actually driving the variability? Why do people respond differently? Now, the uh, concept of nutrition has significantly changed. Now we have a much more complex picture, but it's not very different to what we had before. We just added the whole concept of gene genomics predetermination and function to the concept of nutrition. We used to rely entirely on the bioactive food component and consider that to be perhaps the most significant factor behind any effect of nutritionals and food. Now we need to interact with the, our understanding of genomics to be able to make sense of any impact of any nutritional on our body.